Alright, here we go. This one should be very fun. Hill and Dale, Ross versus China. Good defensive capabilities and a desire sometimes to play that way for both of these sieves as we have got another game. Welcome back, folks. It is going to be more the Viper play in China. Honestly, at this point, I, I, he might as well just role play as a Chinaman. I feel like Viper is so on the grind, so committed. I love the way he commits as well. Some people might get bored like, oh, I want to play some HRE or some France. No, he just, like, he wants to extract every piece of info he can. Every win, every loss, he wants to kind of just eke out that advantage. And that's what makes a good pro player, right? Meanwhile, his opponent, Illusionist, he has played a lot of Age of Empires 2, from what I understand. Almost like 3,000 games. So he's a well-first RTS player, but he's not really got much of a competitive career. I couldn't find any details on this guy, but I did notice that he is sitting in the top 100. In fact, 55th right now. 165 games. Boy from Slovakia. 59% win rate, so not bad. This guy should put up a, a decent fight. We'll see if he can actually overwhelm Viper as he is playing as Russ. And Russ, sorry, Roos. I've been starting to say it half-half, so let's just try and get full into the Roos. The Roos are quite an interesting sieve to watch right now. Uh, broken in some ways, broken in literal true fashion in other ways, right? When we talk about things like the relic bug, I'm not going to explain that one. That one needs to disappear quickly. It's almost kind of, there's some sense of, of hilarious irony in a company called Relic having a game-breaking bug to do with the relics, isn't there? But yes, he's playing as the Civ that can do that. I'm not expecting to see that out of the Illusionist. Although then again, with a name like that, maybe he does make that hap magic happen. And when Viber call calls him out for cheating, he goes, no, it's an illusion. But I'm expecting some fair play here. And it's going to be interesting to see what he goes for because Ruts, they do have a bunch of different power points. Uh, remember, the Roost, one of the things they can do is they can go for these Horse Archers in Castle Age that are quite potent. They get access to longer range Spring Orbs if they go for the correct tech up for Imp Age. And when you get that ultra late game, you can talk about Strolt Seed. Even earlier than that, though, you, you've got to consider the power of going towards the... Um, the Knights, right? Like potential early Knight Rushes. I think, by the way, once they fix Knight Rushes, even after the potential nerfs coming towards Knights or buffs to Spearman, we might start to see more Knight Rushing again from Russ. Because the problem right now is when you play as this Civ, um, if I recall correctly, it's mainly to do with like the, the damage stats and armor stats, is when you build units, if you build early Knights and then you tech up to Castle Age and you upgrade to regular Knights, the currently existing early Knights will not actually buff. They will not get buffed. They will not get the increased damage. They will act as if they're still early knights. Any new knights will have the new stats, but the, the existing ones on the field will not. I think that is part of the reason, by the way, why we've been seeing a lot less knight spamming out of the Roos in the Feudal Age. Because they're one of two sieves, I believe it is, that get access to Feudal, na uh, feudal Age knights. The other one, of course, being the, the one we don't speak of, folks. The filth. The baguette wielders. You know who they are. But this is something we do see a lot of, Roos. It's the commercial side of the business, right? The Golden Gate. Golden Gate, absolutely amazing landmark. This one allows you to trade 100 of a resource for 150 of another. Something you can utilize very regularly to get a quick double TC timing off the back of selling 200 gold for 200 uh, for 300 stone. Something that's very achievable when you do the hunting, right? Which we're seeing a, a decent amount from both. So Lou's just getting out there looking for the wolves. Right now, 230 mark. This wolf will get him up to the next level as bounty. Remember, uh, the way the bounties work is these different guy creatures are worth gold. And once you hit the bounties, you get uh, gold from hunting cabins more regularly. And you have a food quicker. That's the cool thing about Roos. I really hope they bring out more sieves of these unique twists on economy. Um, the only thing I will say, and I've said this multiple times, I feel like I just have to keep emphasizing it because it's really important, uh, is what you're seeing out of Viper, right? Where Viper's sniped out these two groups of deers, preventing his opponent from getting access to that that gold intake and increasing his his uh, bounty system. I think in regards to this, while Roos originally everyone thought was going to be broken and overpowered, I don't think they're going to be. I think as, t as like once the spring ones get fixed, most importantly, maybe the horse archers get a slight tweak, I think Roos is going to fall into the middle of the pack they definitely have advantages, but against a high-level player, once people start to kind of perfect their build order and the way they open against opponents, and especially if we do end up going towards fixed map seed generations in a ranked format, I think Roos is going to struggle in that regard simply because a good player will not allow you to get your bounties anywhere near as quickly as we've been seeing a lot of players get in the opening weeks of this game's release. And yeah, you can already see this, this harvest rate 
buff. Mm, that's good. 10% extra food gather rate means if we look at the income per minute. Oh my, oh my. Of course, Viper is not prioritizing food as much of, as his opponent right now. Uh, we haven't really talked about what Viper's opening is. We have seen it a lot, watching a lot of his China games. It's more or less the same. Barbican to cover the choke point. Wolves for the other two, uh, which he's was prevented from getting down by the scout here. It's important you get these wolves down against the Roos in this kind of setup as well. Right now, Viper is not able to expand across his base completely, and he's wanting to, which is why you see the second TC. And more importantly, when you talk about this matchup, Roos has the edge because if you match each other's castle age timing, the Roos player will arrive quickly in your base with a horse archer battalion, right? And then he'll start sniping out your economy. So it's really critical he gets these, these lines down, these walls down quickly. And that's why he doesn't even care if he loses the villager. He's committed to just building these up ASAP. Other thing to highlight, by the way, uh, if you box yourself in like this against Roos, it can be beneficial from an eco-booming perspective. But as always, whenever you choose to wall yourself in, you're forfeiting a lot of map control. And the worrying part about doing that against a Roos player is a lot of Roos players have started to clock that the hunting cabin isn't that good. It's much better to go for the Monastery because you get instant access to the the Warrior Monks without having to invest uh, the extra 200 wood and whatever else. And then you can start very quickly, immediately as soon as you arrive in Castle Edge, running them out and banking these relics. Not to mention, by the way, very good Roost players have started to identify how critical Warrior Monks are to successfully winning these 1v1s. The reason being, by the way, is the Warrior Monks, when they are engaged in combat, provide a Saint's Blessing aura around them. The Saint's Blessing giving bonus armor and damage to all units in range. Pretty big deal when you're running these, you know, these kind of small probing armies, even these large scale armies, because the AOE is a decent, uh, a decent size. I'd say it's 1.5 times the size of the TC. Seems about right. And that's especially easy to utilize when you're playing a horse archer spam, right? We actually saw this the other day from Guz, where even though he didn't really have much of a front line to support his horse archers, because it was the early mid game, his opponent didn't have a strong enough army to insta snipe the warrior monks, which meant they got in, they gave the buff, and even if they died, he then had the edge even against a, a slightly superior number of archers because his horse archers not only were tankier, but they were hitting for more. By the way, for those wondering what this solution to horse archers is, and we might even see it this game, in fact, if, if Illusion starts to build into them. Can you guess it? So, for a while, a lot of us thought that the solution to horse archers was simply to build archers, right? And that's not bad. That's a good static defense, right? It's, to me, that solution to horse archers of just building the cheaper version so you can build more is similar to the argument about spearmen versus knights. The actual better counter that I've seen time and time again is that supported by a nice bulk of horsemen. Reason being is, as we've highlighted a few times now, horsemen move faster than anything else, and they move faster than the horse archers, and they can stay on top of them. Also, horse archers get bonus damage against ranged. Guess what? They get that bonus damage against the horse archers. If you watch those horsemen poke their spears and see how quickly the horse archers' health pool of 85, I believe it is, disappears, you'll understand why horsemen are the solution. And here's the Abbey of Trinity we talked about, by the way. Meanwhile, Viper's base, I believe, yes, he is in the middle of building the Imperial Academy. So another reason he turtles like this is he wants to go back to the second landmark. He understands he's going to be military present early on. So he just wants this solid choke point that he can easily hold as he tries to boom up. But as we said, the trade-off of doing this is while you now have a safe base, well, Roos has rule of three quarters of the map. Something I expect him to utilize quickly. Also, something we didn't highlight, by the way, is he took the Pro Scouts. Some we've been seeing more of. Definitely very valuable when you're playing as Roos. I think Roos are the faction that use this best because remember, you build hunting cabins early. The hunting cabins are how you're producing scouts. So getting a scout army is feasible because you're not wasting time in your TC producing scouts there like other sibs would have to do. And uh, after about, I'd say after one load of deer are, are returned, like one location worth, you've basically made your value off of it. And the other thing that Roos benefit from, of course, is that Bounty system means they're gathering from these food supplies quicker. This food supply being one of the most superior ones on land uh, because the deer carcasses you gather from quicker than farms, sheep, and berry bushes outside of sieve-specific buffs. So has he got the warrior monks going out? So this is his first warrior monk. Yeah, I think that is his first one so far. So I'll ride him out. Meanwhile, Scout's trying to get info still out in the field. He was for a while banished from his base. So I don't think there was a gate for him to get out. They finally added one back in. But yeah, they're going to move across to his opponent's side of the base, of the map first rather, to just secure these 
harder to reach relics. And that means that actually Viper's probably not going to have a single relic in this game. Because remember, even if he chose to go for the monsters once he techs up, you know, you got the old men. The old men don't move fast. And that's the, the really big difference here is that you can easily exploit this tech up building compared to just going for Hunt Lodge to quickly move out with these warrior monks that... I don't know why the Roos said these... Are, like, the Roos are a, a kind of the more thoughtful, gentlemanly, like, thinking in a more modern age, looking after the elderly, right? Like, that old dude, he needs a horse. It's unfair he has to walk everywhere. Yeah, thanks, guys. That's that's really thoughtful. That's really forward thinking. Give him a spear as well he can fight. Dude, he's been fighting all his life. Let him retire. Nope. Nope. To war, boys. So yeah, 1.62 tiles, as you can see. So he's going to bring that one back. There should be another one or two warrior monks being built. Yeah, I just like the constant production. I think they're just so valuable. You should never... It, as long as you have excess economy, you should never stop producing some warrior monks until you're like at seven or eight. That way you can... Every time you go in for a skirmish, you can take like two of you. And if you lose them in the skirmish because they'll be your melee line, right? Then you can always then just fall back, have two more to go in with the main archer line because we are seeing the horse archers we talked about. The problem he has is right now, he has no way in, which is why he scouted this out. He's building a siege workshop. Really good. I like what's coming out here. He needs to apply pressure and he needs to do it fast because this is the thing. He's playing against China and this is what makes this matchup so interesting, by the way, is the siege weapons. So you can already see the astronomical clock tower is, is down. It's starting to build the springles. Only takes 10 seconds. The cool thing about the roost, though, is if you go to an impage... You have this cool advantage against even China. Because remember, they have a unique siege workshop that gives them access to a unique tech that increases the range of spring orbs by an additional two. On top of being able to get roller shot, meaning you will always have superior range over your opponent's spring orbs. Of course, that's some time off. Whether we end up in in-page, we'll just have to see. It is potentially possible that Illusionist goes for a quick boom. But I think he's interested in just trying to get into the base quicker. The problem he has right now is, is these choke points are going to be rough to get through. They're just so thin. He could wrap round, and that would potentially be an option. It would take longer to do so, and thus it would take longer to reinforce in a, a prolonged slog. Military-wise, we are going to see the barracks going down, so Viper should get some spearmen out. Understanding you're against a Roost player, so you know any sort of shock and awe tactic is going to involve cavalry out of them, whether it's the horse archers or the knights. And right now, it's just a continued spam of horse archers still. Triple archery range, so he's really in for a penny and for a pound at this stage. That being said, so far, three of the five relics banked. One en route, I believe. And then one more to be collected. One sitting here. Ta -da! Has this been seen? Yeah, he does know about his location. And yeah, he's had enough of this. Really, really good play, actually. This is how you deal with this. If your opponent won't come out, and you're talking about this choke point type map, because this is a rough map, right, to, to deal with these more tanky, turly type nations like HRE, like China, then make him come out and play. The other cool thing about Warrior Monks is like, well, you can't do this cheesy super early time like the Delhi where you get extra gold and you take them before Castle Age. Once you hit Castle Age, you move out, you blitz out so fast. That's all three sacred sides. So this is where this gets naughty. Look at the income per minute. So it says the Viper is ahead right now. But when I look in the base of Roos, I see nobody working on gold at all. No single village is working that. There's 11 working with the gold line for Viper. And now you're talking about the situation where with three banked relics, it's 300 gold per minute for Illusionist on top of another 300 gold for, for controlling these sacred sites. And he still needs to bank these two last relics, which he can easily do. So if he does that, he's going to exceed the income that Viper can gain. And this is all off the back of one TC. Yeah, still one TC. Compared to his opponent, who's built the second TC at the back here, you'd expect him to scale better economy-wise. But this is what's allowing the Roost player in the situation to stay competitive with what the Chinese player is doing. And this is a lot of horse archers. This can be rough, remember. Horse archers, they don't kill siege weapons that quickly, especially tanky siege weapons. They get eight range resistance, so most of your range damage is not going through when you attack these. But going into the night production would be a, a, like a, a bit of a pricey transition, I want to say. Illusion is still just showing no signs of letting up, though. The problem I have is like in this time, you really could have went in page. And the concern is that you could, at this rate, arrive in your opponent's base and they could have went in page on you. I don't know if Illusion is playing off the anticipation that his opponent is building a, a Springwood army in the meantime. But more importantly, because he's taking the sacred sites right, he's playing for what happens in seven... Five, seven to seven minutes. He's not playing for that 10, 15 minute timer. If he was, he would have just went and tech boomed into tech four. 
Wooden Fortress is now going down. Remember, these are a little bit more pricey, but they are much more tanky than the outposts. They also have the economical benefit, as you can see back in the base, where they're boosting the drop-off. So all these villagers are, are dropping off 12 wood instead of 10. Always build these, folks. These are amazing. If you build the Kremlin instead of the Golden Gate, also utilize the Kremlin that way, as the Kremlin functions similarly. It gives that, that aura. And remember, it's a chained effect, so if you keep building your wood line out, you'll keep, you'll keep that buff of the new drop-offs of Lumber Camps further away from the Wooden Fortress, which is why you can see the influence is huge here. And now, yeah, another move. Lucius just getting the, the walls down. So this is really frustrating if you're play, uh, playing as Viper, because, I mean, how are you going to get through these, palaces, these reinforced palisades quickly? Because you're going to be investing in Springles, it's kind of predictable. Speaking of Springles, time for some of that on that action. Advice definitely for Viper, but look at the horse archers. He forced him to come out, and this is where you have the advantage. Vera and Shugnu have been built to counter this out, but he's going to have to back up. And the chase will continue. The scouts as well just try and body this. They're going to move in straight onto the Springles to snipe them out. Remember, they do 16 burn damage on each of these, which means they'll be able to get through the Springles quickly. And the horse archers are overwhelming him. Viper, he doesn't have the sustained numbers coming out here. That being said, the Sprills haven't been finished off just yet. They're all weak, which means that you'll refocus fire with the Horse Archers to get rid of them now. And they'll just all start to crumble. So plenty of Horse Archers left, still 30 to work with. There was no involvement from the Warrior Monks, by the way, but the advantage is still there for Illusionist. That being said, he's in range of the Zhugnu. This is where it starts to be a mistake. He needs to back off now. Remember, they have equal range, so now he's starting to lose this. He will back out. Gave time for more of the walls to go down, but still advantage is sitting there for Viper. However, he needs to rebuild the Springles. He goes for the Nest of Bees instead. A nice solid choice as well against the Horse Archers. They don't have that much health, so the Springles feel a little bit less valuable. And now look at this. The Warrior Monks are here. More scouts being produced as well, because remember, they are cheap, only cost 60 food. He can produce them out of the hunting cabins, and more importantly, for 110 health, they aren't bad cannon fodder and very good at taking out siege weapons. Now split formation. Viper's gonna back up. He's only got a few minutes though, so he needs to get out quickly. Remember, these sacred sites still in control for Illusionist. Illusionist starting to rebuild those springles. Only one Siege Workshop working on it right now. Does mean that potentially Viper can outnumber him and he has to be aware of this. However, Viper, he's kind of hoarding some food and gold at the moment. I hope he's not thinking about what I think he's thinking. Because that could actually backfire heavily if he's going towards that tech up. You have a small window and you need to do something. Spearman reproduced. No Maganel play coming out. And the reason is because... From a Lucius perspective, because he can't get info inside the base, he doesn't know whether his opponent is just mass Springles again or whether he's going for a composition of these Nesta Bees and the Springles. Which means that Maganel could just be a completely wasted investment. Remember, fairly pricey at the 400 wood, 200 gold. And here it comes. We've seen it so often from China. The keep. Go try and get it down. All Sarch is moving out. Scouts as well. Spearman trying to get in the way. And the scouts will move in onto the Springles. Snipes one out. Nesta B's trying to get the shots off. He's moving these scouts so quickly, though. <gasps> Are we going to get a Wall of play? Warrior Monk moves in. He hasn't started activating it. There it is. The Wall of going to come out. They try to target it, but can they get through him? He was healing it up. The Warrior Monk, he gets him. Focuses fire. The Zhugnu bring it down. The keep goes down. It is in position, and it will force the retreat out of Illusionist. A nice attempt, but way too late. He'll back up. He'll be chased still. His Springles being sniped out by the veteran Spearman, and there's plenty of Spearmen here. The Horse Arch is trying to work it up, but the Zhugnu are just too powerful. The rate of fire on these units are just decimating the Horse Archer army. An Illusionist, he had no tech up in mind, right? Like, yeah, he's full in on this. Sacred Sight's gonna be decapped on the right as one Spearman runs all the way out. That's gonna cancel the win condition. The main army is dead for Illusionist. He will continue to retreat and expose his economy, as well as start to give up these Sacred Sights he claimed. And now look at the movement on the gold veins. Viper says, whew, my base is getting dry, mate. I'm going to have to expand out here. I hope you don't mind. So I'm just going to stretch my legs out, do some squats on the bodies of all your lads. I believe they call this teabagging in the Halo world. And such a fatal error out of Illusionist. Illusionist really messed up when he went into that initial big, the first big fight we had. There was a, a critical detail we discussed that makes Roos very powerful that was not utilized. And it was the... Set, it was the Saint's Blessing. There was no Warrior Monks involved in that fight. They weren't even in the neighborhood, which is a crazy thing to think about when you consider he had, what, three, four Warrior Monks? So he easily could have had some there. And it's such a costly error. Not to mention, you never bank this relic either. Small details like this, it's easier to forgive sometimes, because remember, 
when you pick up a relic, you can't see it on the map anymore. You don't even realize it. So in the end, he wasn't even getting up to that 500 gold treacle we said he could have reached. So he's always been behind an income per minute. And now this means every army he loses here is super costly. His opponent is able to replace it much quicker. And this is where we see the attempt to pivot. He starts slapping down the stables. But the question is, is this too late? Because Viper is taking control almost in the blink of an eye. Three quarters of the map. It's, it's just completely switched hands. No Man's Land is now Viper's Land. And more keeps going down to make sure there's no cheese on the sacred sites again. And Baton Ram's being constructed quickly. Viper understands that he has him by the balls and he wants to squeeze. Not in a friendly way. And yeah, you, you can actually see that Lucius doesn't understand the power of Saint's Blessing. He never even tried to get the improvements, right? He didn't get the improved blessing for damage. He didn't get it for the range. He never, ever once utilized any elements of this powerful buffer that you have, especially when you go heavy horse archer army. It's very confusing, but it is actually worth doing. It feels like it should be worth doing because you have no melee line, but... You know, you pay, think about it this way. You pay 100 gold and 20 food to get, like, a 15-second buff or whatever uh, for plus one damage and plus one armor on plus 30 units. That gives you the edge. And now you're on the edge of being pushed out of this game. All such is just ain't there. Not enough of them. Knights aren't coming out quick enough. They're going to Zerg in. Blacksmith upgrade. He never, he's, it just doesn't matter. It's not quick enough. He calls the GG when he sees that many Chinese in his base. He knows it's all over. The Chinese invasion fleet is just too strong. 